Um, so we're absolutely delighted uh, to have at uh, this week's uh, forum, Dr. Sarah Hickman. Sarah is uh, Sarah is sister of Katie Hickman. They kept it quiet for a long time, but I suppose the clues in the surname. Um, Sarah is a medical doctor. She uh, was at Norfolk and Norwich and came here and did. Sarah it was an academic four months block, wasn't it? Yeah. But you came and did with us and you thought actually this could be quite good and we said come and do a phd and you went yeah okay i'll come and do a phd and we've had a we've had huge pleasure having sarah um, in the department she's been um extremely hard working um, applied herself and um, been amazingly collaborative helped huge numbers of people been supervising medical students and working with the, um, the, the IT department and the governance department um, in terms of creating a huge database of mammograms uh, with a view to um, looking at artificial intelligence algorithms uh, for uh, the, the mammography screening program um, in the UK. And Sarah has just handed in her PhD. She's still got two months of her PhD, of her three years to go. So I think this is a massive achievement. In fact, a big round of applause, please. <laughs> so I think that is really exemplary. It's just a fantastic achievement. Um, and Sarah, of course, was highly motivated to do this because she got a, a, a secondment to NHS X. And because she was working in, in digital data and NHS X, um, well, it's now called something else, NHS Digital, isn't it? But NHS X is very, keen on artificial intelligence algorithms it seemed like a, a terrific place for Sarah to go and uh, and and uh, apply her experience and work with the wider uh, digital team and um, the other great piece of news is that Sarah has got a, a radiology number so it's fantastic sadly not in Cambridge we're very sad that you're not in Cambridge Sarah we'd like you to move back to Cambridge as soon as you possibly get an opportunity or an excuse to do so but Sarah is going to be in London, which is brilliant. Um, so Sarah, we're very much looking forward to hearing the results of your PhD. And I hope you're going to tell us a little bit about your, your journey as well. So Sarah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I couldn't be there in person, but thanks everyone for joining. Um, so I'm very excited to go through uh, the results of my PhD. Um, but first of all, this is by no means an individual effort throughout the past those four months of comment and the past three years. Um, there are more people uh, involved than just people in these slides, but these are the key people. And an especial um, thank you to, to Professor Gilbert for supervising me and kind of cheering me on and standing by me the past three years, um, as well as Nick and Richard, who I know are on the line or in the room. Um, and Juan, who, who helped me the past five months immensely with all the statistics that I'm going to present today. So there's a breakdown of the talk uh, to start with. I'll go into a bit about AI in general and then AI in breast cancer screening and then take you through kind of the journey of the PhD in terms of building the database and evaluating the different tools. And in, we presented this a couple of weeks ago at the breast screening department and we had a discussion around um, what we thought would be the best application in the future or what should happen next. And so really at the beginning, um, I'd just like to say to everyone, if you can have that in mind throughout, just thinking about as radiologists, where would you want to see this slot into your daily practice? What questions would you have before you would be happy? Um, is there any more information that you would want? Um, so just keep that at the forefront of your mind. Well, at the end, I think I'm trying to do this in half an hour. So we have hopefully lots of time for kind of questions and discussion around this. This is an overview of AI. Why did, um, why did I have this, the opportunity to do this PhD? Well, really it started back in 1950 with Alan Turing asking, can machines think? And this is from there in the 1950s, that development of um, something called the Dartmouth Summer School around the discussion around the development of these computer systems that could potentially think for themselves. And we had in mammography, CAD-based systems in 1988, um, 1998 that could um, help the radiologist by prompting, but these weren't necessarily based on what we call artificial intelligence. They weren't thinking for themselves, they were rule based algorithms. So in 2012, there was this big image net. So when you log on to um, Amazon or Google and it asks you to check those boxes, is this a motorbike? Where's the zebra crossing? That's actually training this big image net database 
um, which led to the uh, creation of these algorithms called convolutional neural networks, which is an example uh, shown at the bottom here, which take the image input, um, run lots of statistical methods over this um, to produce a, an output. In it. And in breast cancer screening, this is a binary output of recall or no recall, um, but it will vary depending on the application. And so the ImageNet challenge um, developed these algorithms. And then in 2016, there was the Big Dream challenge, which looked specifically at applying these algorithms to breast cancer screening um, and mammography. And from there, they had over 100 submissions of algorithms. And then they evaluated the top eight and combined them to, to produce a model which um, performed not as well as the radiology at the time, but it was um, comparable in terms of its performance. So that's why we, we're here now in terms of talking about artificial intelligence. Um, we now have the volume of data, we have the computers that are able to perform this task, and mammography is a really good use case because of this binary recall, no recall output, which these um, algorithms are well suited to. And the NHS, um, as Professor Gilbert details at the beginning, I'm currently working with NHS X, who are really interested in how we can bring artificial intelligence into daily practice. But also there's a lot of Kind of hesitancy policy governance that needs to be put in place first hence all of these documents have come out over the course of my phd which i've been trying to keep on top of to really look at the landscape of how this deployment approach um, might take place um, but still lots of work going on here in terms of radiology specifically um, this was a nice paper recently published which looked at the fda approved algorithms and as you see again mammography is a really nice use case and we see it always coming up in the radiology AI field um, because of the volume of data available and again as I say that class typical classification um, task um, and what we did notice however is that the number of the quality of um, evidence and I'll detail this a little bit later but the quality of evidence the number of studies reported um, around these algorithms is actually quite limited um, hence here it's highlighting that there's not much multi-site data available um, for these algorithms. In terms of just a quick pit stop in terms of the metrics that I'm going to keep talking about throughout this talk. So sensitivity and specificity are the two main um, kind of what we call the clinical metrics that we use to evaluate the performance of these tools. Um, and then these can be combined in something called the AUC, which is the area under this receiver operating characteristic curve. And I'll just talk through this. So this is basically the spec one minus the specificity normally, but I've just inverted the axis here. So it's specificity by sensitivity. So it's these two metrics plotted against each other to provide an overview score. Um, and what we do is, so if you're at this yellow dot here, you're 50%, 50, 50, 50. So it's as good as chance. Um, in breast cancer screening, um, we would operate here at a very high specificity. So we don't want to recall too many people. Um, and at a really high sensitivity, we wouldn't want to miss anything, so we'd be operating at this end of the curve. But really where we want to be operating is up here. We want really good specificity and really good sensitivity. And so we want these curves to be, the top of that curve to be all the way up here. Um, however, depending on how hard the task is, uh, this is quite a hard task that the algorithm's performing, it, it tends to drop. So these are the three metrics that we'll, we'll be talking about. In terms of, again, looking at breast cancer screening specifically, um, there was a report published last year by the National Screening Committee, which um, these are some of the summary lines from that report. Um, and the bottom line really was that the evidence wasn't of sufficient quality or quantity to currently support the implementation of AI into breast cancer screening. And actually for my PhD, this was uh, quite a, a kind of fundamental piece of evidence in terms of finding what those gaps were um, in, the lack, in the current reporting. Um, and where I could really tailor my experiments to, to fill those gaps in evidence. So to start with my PhD, um, I conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis to look at what the current evidence base was for the use of these tools, um, how good were they, but also what data was being used. Um, the, this graph here is looking at something called the quadas um, and tripod scores, which looks at the bias of reporting in those papers. So there was a high risk of bias. Um, although we did find that the algorithms were performing similarly to the readers, but could we truly say this um, considering the bias seen in these, in these uh, papers? And that was mainly due to the small databases that they were using, um, that they were cancer enriched databases. So they weren't, screen, breast cancer screening is something called class, has class imbalance, where we have a high proportion of normals relative to the number of cancer cases. 
um, as well as they were often performed in something called an in-house or internal database so that they had both trained and then held out a proportion of data to then test on rather than say for example taking a model trained in New York and then applying it to a UK database to see so to check for something that we call generalizability to check how that model then translates and does it stand up when you show it different data so because of that bias what we plan to do was build our own database um, to fill those gaps so to provide external testing a large representative database to overcome this class imbalance that wasn't seen in previous literature as well as be independent of the um, algorithm um, companies that were producing these um, algorithms um, and hopefully um, providing high quality evidence to fill those gaps in the national screening committee report um, these are two exemplary papers i think in the field that we found uh, by salam et al and shafra et al um, the um, they show nice, good performance and they were also some of the first papers to cross compare the algorithm to the program reader performance um, so i talked about earlier those metrics of sensitivity specificity and auc and what those metrics are measured against in terms of the algorithm performance is normally the gold standard of the human reader performance. Um, and both of these uh, report the Swedish screening program reader performance and compare the algorithms. So here we're seeing that the AI is set at that, as I say, set at that high specificity that we see in breast cancer screening. So we don't recall too many women and that we see the AI sensitivity at that, at that fixed point is actually better than the human first reader. And then if we look at the results, these are from the dream challenge that I mentioned earlier. And if we set this time, we set the sensitivity point. Um, we see well, the AI isn't as good as the first reader, but it's still performing very, very well. So looking at an overview um, of at the beginning, I showed that there's 15 FDA approved artificial intelligence algorithms, but they can perform different tasks. Um, sometimes you get the same model. Uh, but performing different tasks depending on where we put that pin in terms of sensitivity or specificity um, but also you get different algorithms so my phd focused mainly on the two applications shown here in green which are triage so can we bypass the human readers um, for a portion of exa exams that are either normal that don't need to be read or can be read by one reader and detection and diagnosis so can the algorithm slot in as a as a reader itself and perform that task of reading the images to either decide whether to recall or not recall and then in blue over here we have um, other applications um, which the braid trial team which professor gilbert is carrying out currently at cambridge and multiple sites across the uk are looking into of how we can risk stratify women using tools such as masking tools where you look at mammographic breast density and see the um, if there's a risk that a cancer could be hidden by the overlapping fibro granular dense breast tissue um, pure density tools um, and then also whether to combine these or using independent risk tools um, and these could be used to guide supplemental imaging or the frequency of screening so we're going to focus at least mainly on these two well we are focusing on these two green applications so ai is based around three things one data to the algorithm and then three the evaluation metrics which I outlined so starting with the data um, we built this large mammographic imaging database uh, of women who attended screening at Cambridge and Norwich and we wanted this database to be representative so what we did was um, queried the national breast screening system to pull out every woman who was screened as part of the program in a sequential order so it's consecutively collected to make sure it was as representative as possible and we've now collected data from um, Norwich from 2014 all the way to 2018 and for two years at Cambridge, producing this large um, mammographic imaging database for 127,000 women. As well as, as I said at the beginning, the majority of women who attend breast cancer screening are normal. Um, so what we were also really interested in is picking out the cancer cases um, to be able to form separate studies on, on these. And there's two types of cancers that we we're interested in it's the interval cancers and these are the women who are diagnosed in between the two uh, mammographic screening episodes um, and so there was the potential that um, there was something on the mammogram that may have been seen in hindsight or maybe there was nothing on the mammogram and it developed in between um, and so what we wanted to see is could the AI algorithms um, potentially pick up these cancers at the earlier screen so we collected all the cancers from 2011 to 2020 um, and these graphs just show the distribution of time period from um, the previous screen to diagnosis, so it's between zero and 40 months. 
And then the second set of cancers was the screen detected cancers. So this was um, women who were diagnosed at their screening mammogram. And again, we collected all of these cancers from 2011 to 2020. Um, and so this allows us to do different experiments in terms of a making sure we have a representative database um, with the correct cancer proportions, but then also doing these enriched data studies looking at um, picking up the um, interval cancers. Um, and this just shows where those time points are for those cancer diagnoses. So the main bit to point out here is the interval cancers that are occurring between the screening episodes. Uh, and we collected mammograms mainly for two machine types, so GE at Norwich and Phillips at Cambridge, um, with a couple of logic, etc. And the reason, again, this is relevant is because of what I mentioned earlier about this generalizability. So can algorithms generalize to different screening programs? So in the UK, we're screening every three years, uh, whereas in Europe, it can be every two years and in America every year. Um, different countries have different, um, so the UK to USA again to Sweden. Um, and then also different mammographic machine manufacturers, because as you can see here, you can see a difference between the post-processing, um, what the image actually looks like that comes out of the different mammographic machines. So if we start by looking at the detection diagnosis application of AI and looking at, to start with at that first use case application I mentioned of interval cancer detection. So these are our AUC plots um, for each algorithm. So we took three different commercial companies and um, thanks to Richard and Nick built this um, in-house system, which would host them and run on our data. And the main point here to take away is that the algorithms are performing similarly across the Cambridge and Norwich data, across the Philips and GE mammograms. And this was really impressive because the majority of, um, well, all three algorithms have trained on less than 1% of Philips data compared to a higher proportion of GE data. Um, but also we saw a difference in performance here between um, the algorithms on different site data. So this DL3 performing statistically significantly better than the other two algorithms. So there is a difference in how the algorithms perform, but actually they in themselves perform similarly across different sites. And it's a lot of text on this slide, but the main result here is that we found that you could pick up between around 20% of interval cancers at the previous screening mammogram, whilst maintaining a 96% specificity. And we expected between 20 and 30% of interval cancers could be seen at the previous screening mammogram. And therefore this is in keeping with what we would hope that the algorithms could achieve. What was also interesting is that we looked at the types of interval cancers that were detected by the algorithms. And we found that the each algorithm was detecting different types of interval cancers. And this raised the question of, should we be using those systems in tandem? So should we be using all three systems um, as opposed to just one system? Would that allow us to pick up more and different interval cancers? And would that be of benefit? And that is a question for, for the future. And then we took, so as I say, that's on a heavily enriched database of interval cancers. So then we took those results and applied them to a, a representative screening cohort of one year from Cambridge and Norwich. And we applied the typical screen detection um, flow. So dropping the algorithm in either as a standalone reader or actually more in the use case example of dropping it in as a second reader to work alongside the human reader and still involving arbitration where there was a disagreement between the two readers. And this is proposed as one of the potential applications. Um, I don't think using the algorithm standalone would currently occur, but this is the proposed, could we use the algorithm um, alongside a human reader in the current workflow? So comparing to those earlier papers that I showed on the Swedish screening data, which is a two yearly screening program, hence why our AUC is slightly lower because um, we screen every three years, but we found that the algorithms um, again are performing fairly similarly. And also this uh, triangle here is the first reader performance. So performing, at the level and it was non-inferior to the first reader, but, but lower to, than the double reader performance when used on its own. So we see this in, in the table format. Um, so here we found that the algorithms were non-inferior when used alone to the single reader. And then when using that combination flow diagram, they were again, non-inferior when, when used um, together. So again, our benchmark uh, was that they would be non-inferior and therefore they would progress to, to prospective testing if they, if they met that criteria. Again, looking at the types of um, cancers detected, we found that 
similar screen detected cancers were detected as you would expect. However, the interval cancers and next round cancers detected by each algorithm did differ, which was again of, of interest as to how we should use the tools in future, whether using them alone or, or you'd get added benefit of using the tools together. Moving on to the um, second application, which is using these tools as an AI triage. Um, so here, there's two potential triage approaches. The first being ruling out normal mammograms, so operating up here in the ROC curve, so operating at really high sensitivity to make sure we're not missing any cancers, but while ruling out a proportion of normal cases. And then the second approach is ruling in highly suspicious mammograms. Um, again, we don't want to over recall, we don't want to burden the assessment clinics. So we would only select a very small proportion of cases to be recalled, so a very high specificity. Um, and how, what percentage of interval and next round cancers could we potentially pick up in this blue area to increase our cancer detection? And, it's, and then I'll move on at the end to talk about how we could potentially use these two approaches together to offset each other. So looking firstly at this um, normal rule out triage approach, um, so the first proposal being that we just take all those, what the algorithm's calling normal, and don't let them get to the reader, and we just take them out straight away and say to the woman that you don't, that we don't think there's anything on your mammogram, we think this is normal. The more um, safer approach, and probably the initial adoption approach, would be to um, triage these mammograms to just one reader only, so the second reader wouldn't read these mammograms anymore, um, and therefore reducing their workload. Um, but providing a safety check of keeping the, the human in the loop. And we've seen this approach applied to, to multiple different papers using different algorithms before. Um, and we found similar results of um, you could miss 1% of your screen detector cancers, whilst you could um, rule out between 35 and 55% of your, of your workload. And this is if you were using the algorithm completely on its own. And to put that in context, the database uh, for this study consists of 70, uh, around 75,000 mammograms, and this would be missing nine cancer cases. Um, but what you could then do is, as we said, the safer approach, which is similar to the, what was proposed in the Bolter paper, is um, using uh, sending those mammograms to just a single first reader. And at this approach, again, ruling out a similar proportion, but missing less cancers, so missing 0.01% of cancers. Um, and really where that threshold lies in terms of what's acceptable in terms of a miss, what would be acceptable to the population as well as what would be acceptable to the screening program is, is currently undecided, but I think the aim was these results would provide a foundation for that discussion as to where that acceptable limit lies. Uh, and this just shows you how these algorithms are working in terms of they provide a continuous score on this zero to 10 scale and they push the cancer cases up here at the high end, at the high score, and they push the normal cases down to the low end score. And these dotted bars are showing where we're setting the algorithm performance. Um, so where we're saying that threshold of acceptability is for it to perform within. Again, interestingly, looking at the overlap of the cases missed, um, all algorithms missed the same one case, but again, they were missing different screen detected cancers when used as a normal to rule out triage. As I mentioned earlier, there's a second um, approach tying into what we talked about earlier is trying to pick up those interval and next round cancers earlier. And again, the first approach being, could we, could the algorithm say, this is highly suspicious, take it out of the reader workflow and potentially send um, the patient straight to one of the supplemental imaging modalities with MRI or contrast enhanced mammography, or potentially um, to, just straight to assessment clinic. Alternatively, again, what's more likely is setting the algorithm at the end of the workflow and saying if anything got all the way to the end but still had a really high score, was still at that kind of 10 threshold, to then call it back to um, either a second check by a reader or for one of those alternative imaging modalities. And again, this approach has been applied before in previous papers. Um, and we found that we're picking up a similar proportion to this Denbrow paper in terms of um, interval cancers and next round cancers, um, whilst trying not to increase our rule in recall rate too much. Um, and again, um, looking at that second approach, uh, we can increase our detection whilst not over recalling. Um, but again, what that threshold of acceptable ca increased cancer detection to increase recall, again, is, is up for discussion. So the last approach, um, and again, sorry, we're looking at 
the interval cancers and next round cancers that are detected are also different by each algorithm. So the last approach that I'll go through is, as I said, using these two triage approaches in combination to offset each other. And here we could apply those two most likely approaches of ruling out the normal um, mammograms to one reader and then this highly suspicious uh, triage at the end. Um, and again, ruling out 35 to 55% of mammograms and then increasing our detection um, by around 10%. But we would get an additional recall rate um, based on top of this. And the argument would be whether um, you would save sufficient screening time of, of the second reader to allow for this additional recall. And again, that's a, a real balance to find. Um, but we had an interesting discussion, as I say, in the breast uh, screening units about other potential approaches to this uh, additional recall, whether you could use another imaging modality, for example, instead of uh, assessment clinics. Um, so that is um, everything in terms of the PhD. Um, but I'd just like to summarise some key points at the end. Um, so AI is about data, the algorithm and your evaluation metrics. And so from my PhD, we found that you could detect uh, around 20% of interval cancers, they detect, the algorithms are detecting different cancers. Um, they were able to generalize uh, to our database, um, as well as they were able to rule out a sufficient proportion of normal cancers and pick up um, a small percentage of interval cancers and next round cancers. So where, um, where do we go next? Um, I think that's up for discussion. Um, I have some ideas, but I'd be interested to hear uh, the audience as well. So thank you very much. Um, I'll stop sharing.